that. Thank you. So I'm Jean Mackert, uh, Vice President of Digital United Health Group and W. Lit Chair. Excited for everyone to be here. I find this is an honored time to have Julie Sweet, uh, Chief Executive Officer for Accenture here. If we start with the uh, W. Lit mission, Excellent. So we're grounded in our mission of connecting, educating, and reaching back. It's an important mission from a standpoint of how do we create this community and empower women in technology across Minnesota. But what's been so fantastic uh, about uh, the virtual world is we can expand across not only from a state perspective, but at a national level. If we think about then the mission of reaching back, we do have an annual uh, leadership or uh, sponsorship uh, fund. Last year, as we know, we sponsored uh, Marie Pena as a 2020 recipient. And currently she's uh, in training right now from the scholarship of moving into then software engineering as a role. A, just as to plant a seed as a potential contribution is that we have the 2021 uh, actually scholarship donations going on right now and uh, just received a text for up to 2,400. And so, you know, here's the QR code, but we also included it within the email that each of us received to uh, honor or to, uh, for the event. I'm excited to welcome two new board members. We have Myra Day Perkins, Vice President HR Business Partner for American, I'm sorry, Ameriprise Financial. And we have Priya Sentil Kumar, a Vice President Technology for Pearson, also joining the uh, board. They're fantastic leaders and have already been involved with WLIT. And this is a perfect time then for them to join the board and expand out our mission. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the others in the board. So Robin Brown, CIO Protein North America for Cargill, Denise Morlock, Client Engagement Director for Three Bridge Solutions, Sarah Schlatteroff, Account Technology Strategist, Global Account CTO for Microsoft, and Jennifer Simon, Modern Workplace Solutions Specialist for Microsoft. Thank you also for our generous sponsors. We have presenting annual sponsors of Digineer, Nutanix, Software Guild, along with Travelers and then annual sponsors with Horizontal, SPS Commerce, and Thomson Reuters, along with Microsoft from an event sponsor. Again, thank you for your support of WLIT, not only for this event, but throughout the year. I'd also like just to plant a seed for everyone during the event, we do have a, a sponsor raffle where you can, during the event, uh, put in your name for the raffle for a mini iPad. The sponsorship is from Digineer and, and really appreciate it. Excellent. We have, uh, I'll introduce uh, Diane Renberg, Vice President of Business Intelligence, along with Analytics and Technology from Travelers. Diana, thank you for your sponsorship. So I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Jean. Um, as Jean said, I'm Diana Renberg with Travelers Insurance, where I'm the Vice President of Data and Analytics for our Business Insurance Technology Organization. As one of the original board members of Women Leading in Technology, I'm so proud to see the incredible growth and continued success of this organization over the last 10 years. Its mission of bringing women and technology together to help them learn and connect with others has never been more important. I'm honored to be a member of the WLIT ecosystem and I'm proud of the fact Travelers also sponsors its mission to connect, educate, and support community STEM programs to reach diverse talent. A huge shout out to the current board. You have done an amazing job. At Travelers, we place significant importance on technology development, innovation, and an inclusive culture to drive business outcomes. Travelers has a long history of using data and analytics to make effective decisions to not only manage our business, but to help, help customers through what are often difficult circumstances. We place significant importance on innovation because the need for us to read the future foresee customer challenges and develop breakthrough products and services has never been more essential in a rapidly changing world. We are also invested in developing and advancing women in technology. 
For example, Empower is a professional business group within our technology and operations organization committed to inspiring and helping women with the support of allies to achieve their career aspirations and have an impact on the community. If you're interested in learning more about technology opportunities at Travelers, please reach out to me or check out our careers page on travelers.com. We look for talent at all stages and broadly across many technologies in areas like data, analytics, software engineering, data engineering, cybersecurity, user interface design, and cloud technologies. Now, in keeping with the mission of women leading in technology, I'm excited to hear with Julie Sweet, CEO of Accenture, and to learn how they are supporting women in technology and how fostering a diverse and inclusive organization has created a strong and growing business for Accenture. I'll turn it back over to you, Jean. Thank you. Diana, thank you. I appreciate it. Excellent. And so now I have the pleasure to introduce Julie Sweet. Julie Sweet is the Chief Executive Officer of Accenture, and she began that role in September of 2019. Before that, she was Chief Executive Officer for Accenture of the North Americas and started as the General Counsel in Accenture in 2010. Now, you know, the, the next lead I'd like to go through, Julie also is on the World Economic Forum Board of Trustees, along with on the Board of Directors for the Business Roundtable, along with chairing the Technologies Committee. Additionally, Julie is the Board Chair of Catalyst and serves on the Board of Trustees for the Center for Strategic and International Studies and for the Marriott Foundation for People with Disabilities, Bridges from School to Work. In 2020, she was named number one by For uh, Fortune's Most Powerful Women in Business. Julie, welcome. So honored that you're here. Great. Well, thank you. I have to share one fun fact. So Diana, the, um, the C who just talked about travelers, who I'm a big fan of, their CEO, Alan Schnitzer, is a friend and also a former lawyer like me. And in fact, when I became the general counsel at Accenture, he used to represent us. And I remember he was one of the first people who at the time when I was leaving my law firm to join Accenture, sent uh, an email telling me what a great company Accenture. And so who knew way back then that each of us would end up you know, becoming CEOs uh, of companies. So, uh, and, uh, and I can attest to uh, travelers, uh, great use of technology um, and also great company. So just a little fun fact. <laughs> Small world. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. And, and really it's such a great organization. I am really passionate about uh, you know, women in technology and really broadly um, more women in business. And I know that each of you have huge jobs and, and spend a lot, but it's it's really great to see how you focus on the community and building the community of women in tech. So thank you. And I'm glad I could be a part of today's uh, kickoff. So thank you. So I wanted to start off with one of your uh, bold quotes around sustainability as the new digital. And you know, you're obviously already putting that into place with your technology approach and company approach with Accenture. Could you share a bit about uh, your, your strategy around sustainability and, and how you view it as a Fortune 500 CEO? Great, well, thanks for the question. It's a topic that uh, I think is so critical and there's a huge opportunity right now post COVID because you know, the, the fact of the matter is companies across the world are making major investments in transforming their business uh, and you know, typically enabled by technology. And at this time when so much is changing, there is either an incredible opportunity that we will grasp or a huge missed opportunity because many things that will help drive sustainability in a broad sense, everything from the environment to inclusion and diversity to reskilling to you know, fighting corruption, sort of if you think about the broad goals of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, these are things that pre-COVID were often add-ons, extra costs, right? And now we can embed a view in the transformation. I wanna give you two concrete examples. Let's take not environment for the moment. Okay. <laughs> hey, child labor, forced child labor. In December, 
I was on a panel with a very famous activist who uh, won a Nobel Peace Prize, who was talking about the number of children. It's you know over it's about 150 million in forced child labor. And I literally called my supply chain uh, lead, global lead after that. And I said, here is an example of where we can have sustainability by design in what we're doing for companies because we're helping all these companies reimagine their supply chain. I said, can we build something so that when you're you know, buying technology to do your supply chain, you can use, have algorithms and data sort of built in and do it in a way. We, we actually did this not to be paid for, like we built this. Um, and Coupa that does closed spend management okay. is now doing it as a module and we're gonna take it across our clients. And so the clients who are investing in their supply chain and in this case in procurement will be able to have this module. Whereas pre COVID, even if you had it, it would have been a spend, right? And this is something that can be easily integrated as you're doing other things. So then if you think about um, you know, uh, IT, we're right now working on uh, really trying to pioneer green IT software development that we would embed in both how we're developing software on behalf and working with our clients, but also something that we can create as an industry standard. Uh, and thinking about when we're doing, you know, AI, for example, can be horribly horrible for the environment because if you don't do it right, it can use a lot of compute that's not necessary. And so this is how in a, um, in a post COVID world, as you're transforming, you can bring this different lens. And so at Accenture, we're, we're doing operating, as you said, ourselves, right? So by 2025 in you know, net zero carbon, 50, 50 men and women, you know, we reskill, we spend $800 million a year. So we're doing everything about that, you know, trying to meet our own you know, obligations in the terms of the way we operate. But we're now trying to help our clients who have these commitments and they have this opportunity and we don't want it to be a missed opportunity. I, I really like how you expanded the, the problem set or the solution set perhaps and then have technology and algorithms part of it. What, what have you found the best way to broaden mindsets for leaders? Well, I think one of the most important things is to bring in it. And if you think about your organization is to bring together a multifunctional look to have the discussion, because what I find, and I talk to mm -hmm. CEOs about this all the time, is that a lot of people who, you know, think about sustainability are not at the same table when they're thinking about business transformation or technology and, and they become, they're separate. And so, you know, today, and all of you in tech know this, like we're always talking about bringing the business and tech together, but you need a third piece of that. Because in many, many organizations, if you bring business and tech together, you're actually gonna miss the, those who are thinking about the sustainability objectives of the company. And uh, now that's not true in all companies, you know, some are real leaders here, but to, to change the conversation of, do we actually have all the, you know, the people at the table at the time and you don't find out about it later. It's a little bit like where we were with security a couple of years ago, right? Where security was always the afterthought. And, you know, now I think, you know, we saw this in COVID in spades 12 months ago when, you know, a bunch of companies put up websites and they were 50% more likely to be attacked. And you're like, oh, okay, this is why, you know, all those, those arguments about security. So think about that with, you know, sustainability. And I think all of us can be that voice at the table to say, you know, have we brought that lens? Have we thought about this? Uh, and, and those of you in technology really are in the perfect place because a lot of what we'll be able to do in sustainability is going to be enabled by technology uh, that we're going to be putting in or different ways of thinking about the technology. I love that. And I, I love your point of, uh, you know, the, the conversations we've had sometimes are business and tech. And, uh, you know, I'll go to a, a different quote, I think is so uh, also bold from you of every leader is a technology leader. And, you know, so rather than just business and tech, it's really every leader is a tech. How do you think about that? And, uh, and what are your recommendations for other CEOs to respond to that new reality? Well, it's a good point. In fact, I, I, I would say it's a, there's two important realities to talk about. The first is that exponential technology change is going to continue. 
And that is a very important reality to understand because there is no one and done. We replatform in the cloud, we do this, the, the, the constant change, which is why the second reality is really every business is a technology business and therefore every leader has to be um, also a technology leader that's different than a technologist, right? I am not a technologist, right? right? right, right. But to understand technology. And when you put those two things together, that's where I talk a lot to CEOs about because, you know, so much of traditional strategy and transformation was what well, we transform and then we're done. And now we have to think very differently about it. So I'll, I'll give you an example, uh, you know, in, in our business where we, we do this for clients and we do ourselves, we have a platform we call Synapse which is what we use in our um, business process outsourcing uh, business. So we take over say finance and accounting. Once upon a time, that was you know, very much in the old days around labor arbitrage. And then it became about what technology driven insights, but now it's something different. What is it now? It's a platform where we're constantly adding the latest technology, right? Where we're not having companies have to spend it on their own to reimagine finance and to keep up with it, right? Because there's going to be parts of your organization right. where you want to own it and you need to keep up for it. But in other parts, you have to say, how can I build? How can I partner to take advantage of the ongoing technology change? It's such a different mindset than like the old traditional outsourcing mindset, right? Um, because it's actually about if there's exponential technology right. change, how have I built my landscape to always be able to take advantage of it? Right. And, and, and that is something that I think as technology leaders, we need to help our business understand because it's very different. Right. Moving from, right. Keeping up and also the value side, as opposed to just years ago, it was a cost savings. Exactly. And so we we're shifting from buyers of technology to consumers of technology, right? When you mm -hmm. shift to the cloud, right. right? as consumers of technology, how are we going to consume it and access the best technology? And what's the way to do that? Right. And uh, it's all, it's all sorts of different partners. And some of it is, you know, your cloud provider, your SaaS provider, but it's also, you know, providers like, you know, in this case, an Accenture with the Synops who are creating, the, who are bringing the technology together so you can consume it in that way and access the future. When you, to your point of digital transformation and overall business transformation, do you have a mental model to think about the pace of business how, in terms of how fast is it really moving and are we keeping up or are we behind? Well, um, so let me give you a very, uh, not surprising and yet in numbers <laughs> startling because um, it's not surprising, but it, when you really see it. So uh, in the fall of 2019, we did one of the most comprehensive studies we've done in our history where we looked across industries and countries and measured companies by their technology, depth, breadth, leadership, and culture. And the top 10%, which we call the leaders, were performing twice as well financially as the bottom 25%. So that's fall of 2019, roughly, you know, about nine months before COVID uh, hit. When COVID hit, I predicted, uh, you know, it, almost immediately when we were out sort of there after we all, I said, look, we believe the gap widened overnight, hmm. literally overnight. And I committed to redo that study 12 months later. I said, let's see where we are in 12 months. We just put that study out about two weeks ago now. And it went from 2x to 5x, 2x, 5x, right? Uh, and so what was also, though, really interesting was there was a new group, which we are calling the leapfroggers. And this was a group that we couldn't identify back in 2019. There, there weren't enough of them. And these are the companies who are thinking about, okay, I'm, I may be in the middle of the pack. Some of them are laggards. Some of them are in the middle of the pack but I don't wanna just catch up. I need to leapfrog because I know the leaders are, are doubling down on their investment. And that's what the study showed that there's this gap is widened. The leaders are continuing to invest, but there's this group that's thinking differently, right? And about how do I leapfrog? And so now what is all that equal? You know, we coined the term compressed transformation. You know, it is the companies who have said, 
we proved to ourselves in COVID that we could move really fast. We're gonna make the changes to be able to industrialize that and move faster than we ever thought we could. And so, so much transformation that we once thought at Accenture would be sequential yes. is happening at the same time. And that is new. That is new post COVID. I find that to be good news. It's that there are different news, you know. There are different options of how to how to play the game and still win. If you find, oh, you know, we've missed an aspect. Let's say. Well, I think it's important, and and again, this is where, as technology leaders. I think you have to help uh, business leaders. We have this mindset, Accenture, progress over perfection, mm. right? So, so first of all, we all know there's never been a perfect systems and implementation technology transformation. There's always like, you know, hard things. And then if you go faster, it's even harder, right? But the question is, um, you know, do, do you wait and perfectly design and get all the requirements while the business is changing, right? And so can you challenge yourself to say it is progress over perfection. You know, what can be done? I was just um, on a call today with a client uh, where they are doing some work in data analytics and they were like, you know, but we're not changing the whole thing. And I said, you know what? You do have to change the whole company. That's absolutely right. But I said, but if we, you know, but what you're doing right now, I said, is progress over perfection. You are taking a piece on and doing it. And, and then you'll think about the bigger piece, right? Because they needed to like get going and they started sort of stepping back and saying like the whole place needs to be changed. And I was like, yes, you know, and, and it's this, you know, and I, and I think in this world, we have to embrace that idea in order to move fast enough because otherwise you get to the sequential and everything must be perfect. And the business requirements and the go back to the reality of exponential technology change. Right. Um, it, and if you don't embrace that, you'll, you know, you'll be done while there's all these other changes that you are then like, oh, wait a minute now, I, you know, I'm, I'm already behind. So. That's right. And there's an aspect of remain calm. I like the, the progress over perfection. Because uh, to your point, the exponential side, it's, uh, it's not how our brain usually works. We're so linear. So it's, uh, I like that. Marking to market, if you will, for, for progress. Absolutely. Well, switching gears uh, a little bit, you've committed to 50-50 uh, equality by 2025. And as we know, uh, to your point of the you know COVID and with the pandemic, we've seen some uh, hard, harder hits to women. Just interested of, of what, what you've done from an Accenture perspective to support women during this time and what you see next for women. You know, it's a, it's a great question. I think one of the, you know, one of the most important things that uh, we've done during this time is, you know, and we're a global company, is done a lot of, of listening uh, to make sure that we're responding to local conditions. So for example, you know, whether you had kids who are still able to go to school was very country specific. Sometimes it was city specific, right? Uh, and then trying to rapidly leverage our scale to make a difference. So for example, in the US where we had lots of schools, um, unlike many countries in Europe that were either out or out every other week, you know, we partnered with Bright Horizons to provide group proctoring so that you could have your child go to the center and be proctored online school. And, you know, and this, this wasn't needed in many other countries where they actually were still going to school, but we needed. And so we really tried to take a very um, fast approach to, to listening. And both, by the way, that was for men and women. Uh, but one of the most important things that we focused on very early in the pandemic was actually the impact, not just to women, but all of our diverse employees of going um, entirely remote in terms of networks, because it's just a fact. There's lots of studies that show that, that diverse employees often don't have the same networks. And what we were concerned about was that if you eliminated any of the casual interaction and now you're working and we all know like the, you know, the 30 minutes and the back-to-back -back calls, <laughs> if you are taking a break, are you going to just go to the network that you know, right? Or, or you know, and there's no opportunity to 
to go to something that's been designed in the office to expand, you know, networks. Uh, and so we made very conscious decisions on how we were going to continue to bring together people, uh, you know, still virtually, but with a focus on expanding networks, even though we were all virtual. And I share that because one of my biggest fears is that, you know, and I'm seeing it in some companies where they kind of wake up and it's not simply the traditional, what everyone's talking about in the news, harder hit for women because of things like, you know, childcare, et cetera, but actually have you not, have you, have you a hit on advancement because the building of networks and relationships for diverse employees has not been nurtured enough under the new conditions. And I think it's a really important area to focus on uh, and something that we pivoted to really early in the pandemic. Thank you, I appreciate what you did, you know, both from the childcare side for women and families, but also that sophistication from a network side. It, it makes sense of when we all got sent home, it was who you knew at that time in the moment, almost as a snapshot as a limiter of your career then. Right. Yeah, and I think it's something that we're all gonna have to continue to focus on even as we do go to office because there is more, I think, structural change, right? In terms of where people work uh, that will require this to continue to be a focus. That makes sense to continue. Uh, how do you create affinity so that there are networks to move up and have that, that sponsorship and allyship? I appreciate it. Thanks. The, uh, you know, similarly from our COVID and, and also social uh, justice issues, interested if some of the biggest changes additionally you've been implementing within Accenture. Well, one of the, the most important things, and I'm really proud of the work that we've done, um, but there's a lot more to do, is that, uh, you know, after George, George Floyd's murder, we, um, you know, said that as a company, we needed to do more to fight racism within Accenture and outside of Accenture. Uh, and that it was time to also um, set, you know, bolder goals with respect to our own um, uh, race and ethnicity representation, both among leaders uh, and overall. We actually, when I became CEO of the US of North America in 2015, uh, we became the first and we're still the only professional services company, at least large professional services company in the US that puts out all of our demographics by mm -hmm. uh, ethnicity specific, not, you know, not as a whole, uh, mm -hmm. uh, veterans, persons with disabilities and gender. And we, we didn't do it because our numbers were great in all those categories. We did it because we believe that transparency builds trust and also it holds ourselves accountable. And, uh, and we made a lot of progress. You know, we more than doubled, for example, our black uh, managing directors between 2015 and 2020. And so we decided that similar to how we have done with uh, gender, that we would set external goals. We already had internal goals. I mean, we treat diversity like every other business priority. You know, we have uh, targets, we have plans, we have accountable executives, and we have very importantly, data, data, data to understand and in, you know, do the insights in the same way that you know, a business leader would not you know, be running a business without a revenue goal, right? <laughs> and without data to say you know, where you are and then you know, adjusting as things you know, kind of go. And so we said, we'd been doing this internally that it was time externally. So we set goals in the US, uh, the UK and South Africa, but also, and this was, I think, just for me, very moving is my entire global management committee, uh, you know, when we went to the GMC to ask for support to do this, because I did not want this to be about a single, you know, the CEO, this really needed to be a collective view. The overwhelming response was that racism exists in all of the countries in which we operate. It's different. Right. So, for example, in many European countries, it's it's often around immigrants, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, et cetera. And they we, we just, you know, as, as, a, as a group, they said we need to take this on more in all of our countries. 
and we can't set goals in all countries because in some places it's actually illegal to do that. And also <laughs> racism is different in each country, but we've done some, you know, in all of our major countries now we have initiatives underway. And so in addition to setting goals, we also are doing um, more training and then we're very consciously investing more in the communities and trying to do that with other organizations to get scale. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we are making progress uh, and, you know, it, you know, there's so much more to go, but I do feel like, you know, we, we didn't let that moment go by uh, as much as the work uh, still ahead is, is great. Uh, and, and that really was a collective decision by our leadership team. I, I really liked the apprenticeship uh, program you have. I, I like how you're you're looking at different paths again to success and to get into technology. So just, just wanted to thank you for that. You're welcome. I'm so proud of our apprenticeship program and our apprentices are amazing. And uh, you know, it, it's, it's really incredible. And it, it helped us actually get to a point where, you know, we looked at all of our job openings and we now for almost 50% of our job openings in the US do not require a four-year degree. And in fact, about 20% of the ones we hire in do not have a four-year degree. And it's allowed the opening up of um, you know, more paths for more people. And oftentimes those are diverse individuals who come through uh, this and, and we focus on skills and it's given us access to more great talent. And I do think that started uh, in, in there are lots of different ways because we did a lot of research in that round, but the success of our apprenticeship, apprenticeship program uh, that really started in, the, in Chicago uh, and in San Antonio helped us see just the huge opportunity we had um, to, to really attract great talent by thinking differently uh, and focusing on skills versus degrees. That's fantastic. I just think it's a great model that can be replicated then in different industries. So thank you. Thanks. Yeah. No, uh, so if we switching gears a little bit, uh, interested of with some of these perhaps crises or you know changes, how has that impacted your own uh, leadership mindset and and your approach? Well, uh, you know. Another fun fact, my first year as CEO, uh, so we have a very odd fiscal year, it's September 1st to August 31st. And so I became CEO September 1st, 2019. And so I had exactly two quarters, six months with no COVID and six months with COVID. So welcome to being CEO. There's like this bond between <laughs> all these CEOs have become, you know, become CEO just before or during the pandemic. Uh, and it's, it's a growing class and uh, it is a special bond. And you know, one of the things that was so important uh, when COVID hit and just a, a great leadership lesson, I think, is that uh, I was very conscious that I had an amazing team. I mean, I mean, I stand on the shoulders of the CEOs before me. We have incredible people and I have an incredible leadership team. And when COVID hit, I let my leaders lead. In other words, it could have been, it was a really, you know, frightening time, right? We had just come off the best sales quarter in our history. We were doing incredibly well. And I like the pandemic was declared March 11th. I did earnings March 19th. No one cared about that quarter, okay? <laughs> and I was one of the first, I had a banker say, you know, whatever you decide to do, give guidance or not, it could change the whole market. I'm like, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> like, I'm just gonna make my call. And we gave guidance by the way, and we met it. But, um, but you, know, you know, I was having discussions on my earnings call about like, are you being too optimistic about your really low guidance, you know? And, and I mean, it was a scary time and it would have been easy to over tilt, to add stress to the system. You know, we were moving our people all, you know, we have 540,000 people. But I looked at my leadership team and I let them lead. I mean, we have an incredible COO, an incredible CHRO and like, I said, you know, and our leaders of our businesses said, you know, you're going to get our people home and serve our clients. I'm going to spend time with our clients to understand what do they need now so that we can pivot to help them. I mean, we reskilled since um, the pandemic was declared over 70,000 people to meet the newer needs of cloud, of collaboration tools, you know, in these early days where we just had to take teams and help people get online, right? You know, we put 
in the UK, the national hospital system, you know, week over a million people who worked for NHS went on teams, uh, you know, because they had it, they had no collaboration tool, like they had no ability to do telehealth, none of that, right? And, and so it was my job to say, look, I need to stay close to our clients. I also need to figure out how we will grow so that we could keep our people, you know, and not have to do a layoff. And I focused on clients and I let my leaders focus on the things like getting our people home. And then we all focused on taking care of our people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that was really important uh, because by doing that, you really were able to get the whole collective strength and be much stronger. And so I encourage you as leaders, when you go through these, you know, cause especially as new leaders, it can often be like you sort of say, no, I need to be in the details and I need to be in the call and, and, and building a strong team and then letting them lead, I think is a really important, you know, leadership lesson that was reinforced for me uh, during COVID. And I'm, I'm super grateful to my team. It's impressive to, to switch, a, really to make that switch to your point, even just teams as one example of so many people moving to a new platform. Yeah, those were, you know, it's, we're kind of in it for so long, but, you know, when you think back about those early <laughs> days, I mean, it, you know, it's, I mean, look, the world's never seen it, you know, the change of behavior overnight that affected everyone, like in every country. I mean, it, it is, it is truly amazing. And I, I hope that we can come out of this, um, you know, with, cause there's still so many people suffering and there's so much economic devastation and it's why I think this idea of building back better, you know, of building in sustainability, you know, and of thinking of collective action, like we saw with pharma, that, you know, I think we, we as, as individuals, as companies and countries have a real opportunity to think differently. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, and I, I hope that's what's gonna come out. I don't know if you saw that um, we helped form this global task force on the pandemic that got, announced a couple of weeks ago to focus first on India and elsewhere. And it's the first of its kind. It brings together companies from the business roundtable and the chamber. And, you know, the, the power of collective action, and I think the willingness of so many companies and CEOs to work together differently uh, is, you know, I think a direct result of the shared experience we've had and the examples of collective action, like the pharma companies around the globe looking for the vaccine, and you know doing the manufacturing, and 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 that is my hope as we continue is to, you know, build back better and to be able to harness the power of collective action and global experience for more issues, not just the pandemic. I, I appreciate that. I find. Uh collective action as required to your point on the global level and appreciate the work you you're doing within uh, world economic forum just as an example also of solving those global issues that can't be solved at, you know with point solutions even even with large large global companies so thank you Thanks. And I'll give you one plug for the World Economic Forum. There is some great free consulting work for all of you in tech that we helped to lead, like on the digital culture and digital disruption, bringing together companies uh, by industry with CEOs and chief strategy officers. So if you haven't gone to the World Economic Forum website, I highly recommend it because it is phenomenal work that has a lot of input um, and, uh, and it's available. So... No, that that's fa that's fabulous. I'm a huge fan of the World Economic Forum. They they helped us as we were looking at uh, digital support and vaccine, and so really appreciate those those resources and you know uh, relationship. Great. If we if we dive a little deeper then into uh, leadership for you, interested in uh, telling us a time or sharing a time when you've had maybe doubt or fear when you've um, when you're moving forward with the change and just interested in the experience and lessons learned. Sure, so uh, let me start with a story uh, because uh, it, it, it ends in sort of how I like to think about uh, risk and failure and, uh, and the, the things, challenges that we all have to do challenging ourselves. So my, 
my husband loves these kind of hokey signs that have sayings that you've probably seen in any Hallmark store. There's, and, uh, and we have a super contemporary house. And so they really don't match my house. And, 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 um, and, and one day I come home and he's bought three of them and literally like one <laughs> is black and white and like two are cream and brown. Like they don't even match. And, uh, and he's like, I want to hang them. And I was like, I really don't want to hang them. So I finally was like, okay, you can hang them in the med room. Okay. So they're in our mudroom to this day. I can take it downstairs and show you. Uh, and it was, it was about a little under two years before I actually um, became CEO. Uh, so an interesting time in my career. And, uh, and one of them says, if your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough. If your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough. And, you know, he kind of had the last laugh because that, that became something that really inspired me because you know, whether it was my own individual career, I was aspiring to be our global CEO um, or the work that I was doing, you know, at Accenture, you know, really pushing us, we were putting in a new business model, the things we were doing on race, um, even way before George Floyd and these things. And, you know, one of the things that I like to talk to uh, young people about is that, you know, I don't like this, this thing about like, taking risks because that that is not inspiring but dreaming big and therefore having that pit in your stomach not feeling comfortable you know taking those risks as a part of achieving something that's big and that if you don't feel that way then you're probably not living to your potential or as a leader that you're not pushing your organization enough Right. And, and that for me really inspires. And so I kind of have a gut check in that if I'm not feeling uncomfortable, then we're probably being complacent. And I think that's true as leaders in our organizations and as individuals, as we think about our own, you know, careers. I like that from a, an inspiration poll and a dream poll. That makes sense. Because I was, what was resting on my mind as, as we were thinking about uh, key questions, I was thinking about your extraordinary career, even to date, uh, and wondering how, how do you think about as you're, you're planning out your career trajectory of, of thinking big enough? I mean, there are only 31 people, as we know, on the World Economic Forum Board of Trustees. And so, uh, you know, that's a, those are bold trajectory uh, goals, How, you know, I'm interested in your process and, and would love to learn from it. Thanks. So it, it, you know, I have never really been asked that question before. That's a good question. Um, how do I think about it? Uh, you know, I will just start with my, my, my father painted cars for a living and my mom graduated from college my freshman year in college. And you know, they always told me that I could be anything I wanted to be, but I was going to have to work for it because, you know, my dad's like, you're born in the wrong family. You know, you got no connections, <laughs> you got no, you know, uh, and, but he did, he gave me and my mom gave me a gift of not feeling constrained. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, they also gave me very hard, you know, like deep, felt values that like we had to make an impact because I you know I saw my parents who my parents used to say you know we may not have money but we have time and so they never had an excuse not to give and I think those two things right this this value around service and giving and not being constrained by things like I couldn't give money you know and this belief that I could do anything have, have really shaped you know, how I set aspirations and, and what I want to do. Uh, and and at, increasingly as I go through my career and I've achieved things that I, you know, frankly could never have imagined having achieved, you know, they weren't even in my, like for their worldview, right? With my experience, yeah. uh, you know, what matters to me very much is the two of those things, right? And I've tried to throughout my career to always make sure that I'm grounded in both, right? Giving back, so being at a place that cares about those things, like in terms of like the kind of company mm -hmm. and that. But then I also think it's it's important to, to not be, you know, to aspire, right? And, and to have an aspiration because you have a bigger impact when you can lead, 
you know, and sometimes I think um, people feel like em embarrassed, like, what, you know, I don't want to say that, or people will think that I'm, you know, being, I'm, you know, too full of myself or whatever. But, but if you aspire to lead and make an impact, right, uh, and, and you keep yourself in your values, then it's okay. Now, I'll tell you one last story. When I was uh, applying to colleges, I, so I was not an athlete, and I was applying to Stanford, and my English teacher at the time, uh, Mr. Hank Woods, was a big Stanford a guy, and he was like, "You'll never get in because you don't play sports." And then, and then he's like, "And you'll never get in because what you wrote." And I, because the Stanford asked you to give two names, two two words that describe you. And when I told him, he was horrified. I said, "My two words were ambitious and pink." Ambitious and pink. He's like, "Ambitious is kind of a negative word, particularly for girls," you know. <laughs> and I said, "Look." you know, at the time I wanted to be president, but I said, you know, look, but this is, you know, I, I, I do. And now, now I would use aspiration maybe, but, um, and, and, and the thing is, I, I share that story because I think we have to all be ambitious. The question is ambitious for what, right? And, uh, and as long as you stay grounded in your values and you work at companies who are grounded in their values so that you're making an impact, whether it's for your team or your community or the leaders you bring up behind you, right? You can't make as big an impact unless you lead, which means you have to be ambitious. You have to aspire for more. I love that answer. Thank you. You're welcome. The, uh, you know, in, the, in that related note then, do you, what advice do you have for women who would like to aspire to uh, senior executive roles? You know, what, you know, what does that, what could that look like? All right, three things. So first, network to gain skills. So why do I say that? A lot of times people think about networking to get the next job and who can help you get the job, but I've always, and I didn't call it this, like network to get skills. I mean, at, you know, I, how did I learn technology? I was a lawyer, right? I mean, I, I, and I was a lawyer at a law firm that had no technology. I had no idea what the cloud was, right? I mean, I, I, none of this, right? When I, when I joined Accenture, I was like, let me tell you about my file system and the, my executive assistant said, I haven't made a physical file in five years. I was like, oh my goodness, you know, I have to like change. So I uh, ultimately made friends with Bhaskar Ghosh who was running our technology business and he helped teach me technology because I said, I can't create value as a lawyer at Accenture without understanding technology, right? And so we became friends and I helped him and he helped me. But, you know, thinking about what are the skills that you need and, and building your network around skills and, and then and making it two ways, you know, helping others as well, I think is really important. And when I look at my career, I mean, my, you know, friendship and the generosity of Bhaskar changed my life. I would never be the CEO now if he had not been willing to, you know, help me learn technology as the general counsel, right? So networking for skills. The second piece is um, communication. Uh, so there's a great book. It's called Weekend Language. It's by Andy Craig. I use Andy as a coach to this date. The single best thing you can do for your career is become a better uh, communicator. And that is everything from how you write your emails, the first line literally saying, why am I writing? And my general rule is if it's more than four sentences, it has to have bullets and subcaptions, right? Yep. And by the way, everyone will read my emails now and I still make myself follow the rule, okay? Because who wants to read an email of paragraphs with like no captions? But I will tell you, it is shocking, right? How people do not communicate that well, but also it's the written, it's the oral communication, the ability to tell a story, to convey your point, to be in it. And it takes work. I work on my communication skills every year. It takes work and you have to do that. And the final piece is setting a learning agenda for yourself. Like I set a quarterly learning agenda and I do it for my teams as well, because I don't want everybody to have to learn in their off hours, right? So Chances are, if I need to learn something, so does my team. So I build it in, right? Um, because too often we ask people to be learners and then we say, do it on the weekends and do it at night. Oh no, by the way, we really care about you being truly human and we want you to have, be with your friends and that, but you know, you better learn. And like, sir, so some of that learning is gonna have to happen after hours, but do it for your team, right? And, and, and they often kind of come together. And then the last thing is give yourself grace. 
because you can listen to all these things and then be like, oh my God, I have to do this, I do this. And the reality is life happens, right? You have an elderly parent, your kids are young, right? They're, you have to pace yourself. And you know, one of my biggest fears when I do talks like this is people come out and they're like, oh my God, I have to do this, this, and this. And it's like, you have to look, look at where you are. I, you know, when I was, when my father was dying at the age of 68 and I had two small children, I was not going out and trying to drum up new business, right? Like, you know, I was a partner in a law firm at the time, like, cause I couldn't, right? And, and there's just different times when I became the general counsel at Accenture, the first year I said, please don't put me in charge of every diversity initiative. Cause I was like, you know, one of the most senior, I was the most senior woman, uh, uh, one of the sort of the second most senior woman at Accenture. I'm like, because I just got here and I have two little kids and I'm learning a company. And I said, I will contribute, but give me a year. Right. And I used my voice. Cause I said, cause otherwise I would never be with my children. Right. When I was like, and they were really young, two and three. So pace yourself. I love that. The, uh, you know, when, when I thought about everything you have going on and, and we only know probably a sliver uh, and in the high performance you're living, what does a discipline look like for you? What does discipline look like? Uh, I don't know. You're asking me a lot of questions to you that I've never been asked before. What does oh, it like? Well, it's because. Because my, my analogy is, you know, the, I've been studying high performance for years and I, I really, what snapped into me for was, uh, was about football and that the higher we go in an organization, we really are more like NFL players. So almost like Brady from a quarterback perspective. And he, as we know, runs nutrition and exercise and, and maybe yoga, I think, uh, but to play at that level, we really are at a high performance level, which just means so much high discipline. And so I was just interested of, you know, at, at your level, what, what does that look like for trade-offs and spending time or the mental model to, to approach life and, and everything life brings us both on and work at home? You know, what I, maybe what I would say is, um, I have this test for myself. So I had uh, breast cancer at 46. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I had two pretty small kids. My girls now are 13 and 14. And, uh, I, you know, been in my job a few years uh, and it, you know, came out of the blue as these things often do. Yeah. And at the time, when I, you know, you reflect on your life, I said, you know, I actually have no regrets. Like not everybody would choose my life, like how much time I spent away from kids, how hard I worked, you know, I sort of missed my twenties, I think. Um, but I didn't have regrets. I, I, I felt like I was there for what I needed to be. And I was there for my, you know, life, but, and, 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 you know, now I'm, you know, I'm a survivor and I, um, uh, am cancer free for several years now. But I, I have this test from that time where I say, if I got sick tomorrow, would I still say I have no regrets? And the reality is the answer sometimes is, no, I have some, I would have some regrets. And then I pivot and I, I change. Okay. What's, what's going on? You know, what, what, you know, what's causing that, you know, that. And so I guess in terms of my approach for life, I try to have, you know, that discipline, because, you know, look, I'm, I'm, there's lots of people who actually would not choose my life, right? I have a ton of trade-offs because I do, I run a big company. I'm not always there um, in the same way I would like to for my children or my friends or my family. My 13 my year old the other day is like, mommy, you don't have any friends. And I'm like, well, I work and I spend time with you. She's like a little less time with me. How about Friday night? I see my friends, you see your friends. And you know what? <laughs> Cause I actually listened to her and I, I called my girlfriend. I'm like, I haven't seen you in ages. Like my daughter tells me I need more friends. And I'm like, I actually have friends. I'm just not seeing them, you know? And, and so I took the hint, but it was very wise. Right. So, um, but you, which is a little tangential, but funny and true. Uh, and so I would just say that's more like where I try to be a uh, discipline. And then I try to like be okay to not be disciplined. So look, I watch NCIS. Okay. I watch Young Shelton, like I watch 
television that is not like, you know, I am not spending all of my time reading the, like the most highbrow books, you know, and, and so, and that's okay. Right. And, uh, and, and I'm happy to admit it. You know? So uh, we're all just human and, and we need that time too. And that, I think that's discipline, like giving yourself a break is also a kind of discipline, but I'm also setting a quarterly learning agenda. So, you know, it's a mix. No, I appreciate that. I, I was, you know, to prepare for this, I've been listening to all of your podcasts and, and reading, and I, I really was impressed also with the, the learning agenda. Because um, to your point, the, the pace of the technology on top of the technology on top of the technology, it, um, I don't know, the math kind of blows up in my head a little bit, but of, of how many exponential changes. And I, I like that grace and, and downtime also. So thank you. I, I just really appreciate uh, the time that you've spent with us. Thank you on the, the new solutions you're applying to technology and people and society, along with the vulnerability of your stories and the test. Thank you, Julie. Well, you're welcome. And thanks. Uh, it, was, it was nice to get to spend some time. And again, I just think all of you should feel so good about what you're doing by bonding together and also the investment that you're making in women in technology, because I think it's really important. It's important for the opportunities it opens up. It's important for organizations. I truly believe that the diversity that we get from having, um, you know, the impact we get from having diverse teams is huge. And it's never been more important when you're trying to do transformation. And you know, the, your board, and I know that there's like a lot of events and things that people volunteer and it, it, it matters. Um, and uh, so, and I love, by the way, the picture of the little girl that you gave the, uh, probably not so little, the, the young woman that you gave the scholars, yes. they like have yes. to smile, you know? So anyway, so thank you for all for what you guys are doing to support women. No, absolutely. Appreciate it. Well okay. then Jade, I think I'm turning it over to you, Jade Denson. Vice President of Mintech. Awesome. Thanks, Jean. I'm so honored to just be backstage with Julie Sweet. I have to just say that now. But my name is Jay Denson, and I lead our programming and member experience team with the Minnesota Technology Association. And before we wrap up tonight, I really just want to give a huge thank you to our WLIT board um, for planning such a major event for our tech community. But can we also just pause for a second and just say, wow, we just had one of the most absolute privilege to listen to one of the most dynamic leaders of our time. And I'm still just taking that in. Uh, moments like these just don't happen that often where you get to directly learn from one of the top 10 most powerful women in business. So this is a huge major moment for our WLIT community. And I'm just happy you all got to experience that with us. Um, WLIT is a community that's part of our technology association, and we're so proud to support our WLIT board as they curate awesome events like these to connect, educate and to reach back. And today is just such a great example of them doing all three of those things. I also wanna pause for a second and just say a huge thank you to our sponsors. Um, and I'm gonna speak on behalf of the audience here because without our sponsors, we not, would not be able to have an event like this today. So thank you to the companies that are investing in WLIT and providing a platform for women to learn, connect and share best practices together. And just when you thought we were done providing awesome events, the WLIT community is also coming back together again in just a month. So we'll be having another event um, talking about what I know now and what I wish I knew then. And I won't reveal too many details, but definitely keep your eyes open for this. And I'm excited to see you all again in just about a month. We're also having our annual Tech Connect conference on June 3rd. And if you haven't already, please check this down and register right away. Um, it's an interactive online conference where there'll be community discussions and uh, a showcase where you can learn a lot about what's happening in technology and how Minnesota companies are leveraging technology to drive business. So definitely check out Tech Connect. I also want to do a quick plug for our job board. So if you're looking to post a job or if you know someone who's looking for a job, our job board is an awesome place for our tech community to both look at jobs and post jobs that you're looking for within your companies. And we're about to wrap up, but before we do it, I want to encourage you all to stay connected to WLIT. So if you haven't done this already, check out our website, go to the WLIT page. You can continue to stay plugged in to all things women leading in technology. And on behalf of the Minnesota Technology Association 
and the WLIT board. Thanks for coming. Thanks to Jean. Thanks to Julie. You all have an awesome night and have a good rest of your week.